This morning's reading is taken from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 to 16, and this can be found on page 1,219 in the Church Bibles, 1,219. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, love as brothers, Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, give us hearts that are open to your words, the words to speak of your love, and the love to share it with others. In the name of your Son we ask. Amen. So we are in the second week of a four-week series looking at our fourfold vision uh, as a church. Last week, we looked at discipleship. Today, we will look at evangelism. Next week, um, we'll uh, look at justice. And at the end of the month, we will look at service. I wonder what you think of when someone mentions the word evangelism to you. Is it a word that fills you with excitement, with expectation and delight? Or is it a word that fills you with fear? Does the mention of evangelism give you, to borrow a phrase from J. John last week, the quiver in the liver? The word evangelism carries with it a lot of baggage, tradition, and emotion. In some parts of the world, you can be locked up for it. In other places, you might be ridiculed for it. In some places, it can seem so fruitless and unrewarding. It might feel like it never does any good. Whatever the reason may be, It would seem that when it comes to evangelism, some Christians are only too happy to reach for the opt-out button. Perhaps one of the reasons for that is that from a personal point of view, evangelism can sometimes feel just too difficult or too much of a challenge. What if I don't know the answer to the question someone has asked? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I end up offending the person I'm talking to and feel like I'm, I've driven them further away from God rather than nearer to him? If you have ever felt uh, any of those things when it comes to communicating God's word, 
then let me tell you, friends, that you are not alone. I certainly remember in my own life when the weight of each of those questions acted as a disincentive to sharing my faith. Are you afraid when it comes to speaking about God? Well, if so, we have some really good role models in the Bible. Some of the heroes of the faith who have felt just the same. Moses, who told God he couldn't do the job because he couldn't speak well enough. Jonah, who rather than speak the word of God to the people of Nineveh, fled and ran the other way. Or even the Apostle Peter, who when it came to speaking up for Jesus in the courtyard, denied that he even knew him. And our reading this morning, I think, serves as an encouragement, not only because it is attributed to Peter, but because of his urging to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for the hope that you have. Or in other words, always be ready to tell your story. I think there's a danger when it comes to evangelism of some super special skills before we enter into the arena. There's a danger that we set the bar far too high. Now, it is true that there are various books, articles, and studies on how to explain your faith. Uh, and many of them, say like the Faith Pictures course run by the Church Army, or the Lost for Words course run by CPAS, these courses are excellent. But let me be clear when I say to you, you don't need to have been on a course to tell your story. Both of those courses, and there are others, are good at encouraging people to explain the Christian faith in ways that provide confidence and practice. And when it comes to a more detailed consideration about responding to people's objections to faith, there are also some excellent resources out there, such as Timothy Keller's work on what he calls dealing with defeater beliefs, beliefs people hold that they say, well, because I believe in this, there's no way that I can believe in Jesus. But here's the thing. You don't need a course. You don't even need Timothy Keller for you to tell your story to another person. Because our story is something no one else can argue with. They can't argue with with its authenticity. It doesn't need to address questions of doctrine, of suffering, of science or politics. It's not an exercise in apologetics. It's simply your testimony of how it is that you came to know Jesus. How you were introduced, perhaps. In some ways, it's as natural as telling someone how it is you met your partner or perhaps even how you proposed to them. Our story, our testimony, regardless of how spectacular it may be or how ordinary it may be, is not just a story about us. It's a testimony about the work of God. It's about God's character. Our testimonies are eyewitness accounts of meeting God in Jesus Christ and the impact that that has. The barrier to being an evangelist needn't be a high one. Each of us has a testimony to give. Each of us a story to tell. And if it's one that you have never told, if it's a story you've never shared with someone else, let me encourage you this week to share that story. 
And if you can't find anyone to share it with this week, come and tell it to me. I'd love to hear it, to be encouraged by it, and to hear your story of faith. But I think there is an even simpler way of doing evangelism than even that. Earlier uh, this year, Miriam Swaffield, who heads up the uh, Christian student mission group Focus, uh, and who'll be speaking here on Tuesday of evening of this week, earlier this year in September, she wrote a short blog piece at the start of the university term on how university students come to faith. Now, some of her writing reflected the research she undertook for her master's degree here in Durham. And in her blog, Miriam wrote this, the number one factor that influences how students are coming to faith in Jesus today is being invited to and experiencing Sunday church. The place of the Sunday church service remains front and center in a student's journey of coming to know Jesus. There's a fair bit of chat around whether the gathered church service at a set time and in a set place really has a place anymore when our culture has no rest day. Sundays aren't seen as special, and younger generations' attendance levels to anything regular, apart from coffee shops, seems unpredictable. And yet, of 100%, 100% of the students I interviewed who came to faith at university named the good old Sunday church service as a vital factor that helped them find Jesus. Now, Miriam's research in this area underscores previous work done that has found the most effective form of evangelism is through personal and relational form. Through personal and relational evangelism. Through invitation. Evangelism doesn't have to be scary. When I uh, think about evangelism, I ask what people uh, think of when they hear the word. When I hear the word, one of the things I think about, or rather one of the people uh, I think about, is uh, Professor Stuart Eggington. Now, I'd be surprised if anyone here uh, had heard of uh, Professor Eggington. I met him uh, back in 1986 when I simply knew him as Stuart. And when he and his wife, Enid, ran the youth club at Selly Park Baptist Church. Two years earlier, uh, in 1984, I'd heard Billy Graham preach at Villa Park uh, in Birmingham. And in response, I'd prayed a prayer inviting Jesus into my life. But the problem was at that time, I didn't know any Christians. I didn't go to church. And I had no idea what to do with the prayer that I had just prayed. And so for two years, I did nothing. And two years later, a friend of mine, uh, a friend of the family, uh, had just been released from prison. He'd been convicted for grievous bodily harm on a police officer and had been sent to what was then known as Borstal, a rather rougher version of what we would now call a young offenders institution. And he was keen to find something else to do on Friday nights than what he used to do on Friday nights. And his sisters went to a church uh, that ran a youth club that was made up of a badminton court in an old church hall, a pool table, a darts board, and a football. It was very much of its time. And after uh, I'd been going there with my friend for uh, a couple of months, uh, one night Stuart said, what are you doing on Sunday morning? Nothing much was uh, my reply. Why don't you come with me to church on Sunday, he said. I'll be here. Come and meet me here on Sunday morning. 
And with that invitation began a journey of faith where I discovered faith in God, where I learned what it was to pray, where I learned to read my Bible, where I learned more about God who was just and loving, about his son who entered human history, lived, died, and was resurrected so that I might be free from the bondage of sin and evil. I learned about God's love for the poor, for the oppressed and the marginalized. I understood in that place that there was nothing better that I could do with my life than become a follower of Jesus Christ. Two years after accepting Stuart's invitation, I took the decision to be baptized, a decision that took me deeper into my relationship with God and eventually, through many a winding road, led eventually to the Church of England and through that eventually to being here today, this morning. Stuart invited me. It was a personal invitation based on an existing relationship that led to a coming of faith. In the two years between uh, hearing Billy Graham at Villa Park and going to Selly Park Baptist Church, it wasn't that I didn't know that churches existed. My family home in Birmingham, about 200 yards that way, probably the distance from Bell's Fish and Chip Shop to this church, there was a big building with a pointy roof, uh, which I knew was a church. But I didn't ever go in there because I didn't know anyone there. I wouldn't have known what to do if I walked through the door. They may have been the most welcoming church that there is, but I didn't go because nobody invited me. Which is why when it comes to evangelism, our challenge uh, for us as a church is to develop not only the culture of discipleship, which we considered last week, but also to develop a culture of invitation. About 15 years ago, uh, a Manchester-based businessman called Michael Harvey developed an idea called Back to Church Sunday. The idea was to invite people back to church who perhaps had been once in their lives, but through life over the years, had just stopped coming. He piloted the idea in uh, the Diocese of Manchester, and 10 years ago, a national campaign, Back to Church Sunday, was launched. Was it something that ever ran here? Maybe. Uh, it was run here, it's been run in, I think, 18 different countries uh, around the world. And during the last 10 years, Michael Harvey carried out research with 850 focus groups made up from the churches that he visited in this and other countries and discovered that while many of the churchgoers he interviewed said they would like to invite someone to church, over 80% of those he spoke to had no intention of doing so. And there was one overwhelming reason which the groups gave for not inviting people to church. I wonder if anyone uh, might care to hazard a guess. And before you say it, it's not the sermon uh, and it's not the vicar. All their friends were Christians? Fear. Fear. Fear of rejection, fear of disappointment, fear of failure, fear of embarrassment, fear of losing friends, fear of losing face, fear of being thought weird because you go to church. Perhaps those fears are ones you can identify with. 
It's often uh, been said that the most repeated commandment in the Bible is do not be afraid, do not fear. And it's one that we read again in our short reading this morning. In his epistle, Peter was writing to Christians who were in a very precarious position. Uh, The Christians that Peter was writing to uh, were spread over what we would now call Turkey uh, and knew they were on the brink of persecution. These people had more than embarrassment or rejection to deal with in terms of the consequences for their belief in Jesus. And Peter knew this. And his response in our reading this morning to them as we read at verse 14, was not to be afraid, not to fear, but rather to place their faith in God and to set apart Christ as Lord in their hearts. In creating a culture of invitation, first we need to lose our fear of failure. And one of the ways of doing that is understanding that whether someone responds positively or negatively to the invitation that we issue, our task is simply to invite. What happens thereafter? Whether someone accepts that invitation or rejects it, what happens if they come to church, what happens in response to what they hear, that is not our job. Conversion, as we know, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Their response to hearing God's word is in God's hands. It's not down to us. Our job is simply to invite. Success is not if they stay or even if they come. Success is making the invitation. I think we also need to embrace the fact that inviting people to church, as scary as it can be, is a way of stepping out in faith. It's like practicing mission training. It's the mission equivalent of couch to 5K. Or perhaps the very first time you turn up to park run. Each time you do it, your faith gets a little stronger as your mission muscle develops. Finally, I think we need to be alive to the fact that God is already at work in people who may just be waiting to be asked. I think the assumption we work on is that people would be offended, horrified at even being asked to come to church Why would I go there? Why would I want to come with you? But it may be that God is already at work in their life and they're just waiting. We need to take seriously the fact that there may be someone we know who perhaps has never been to church or perhaps once went but hasn't been for a long time in whose life God is already at work. In his research, Michael Harvey found that 70% of the people he spoke to had in mind at least one person who they would have liked to invite to church but had never asked. So in order to create this um, culture of invitation, as a church. On December the 9th of this year, uh, at our 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 6.30 services, we'll be holding invitational services. There will be an encouragement to each of you to invite someone along on December the 9th to this place, to come with them, to offer to meet them here, so that it isn't too scary to come with you. And it's my hope that we will do this once a term 
December the 9th, this term, and then again in Easter term, again uh, three, three, four, possibly four times a year. And in the weeks before that service, in the weeks between now and December the 9th, could I invite you to be praying as to who it is that you might invite? Who it is God might be calling you to ask? That one person who you could bring along on December the 9th to the service. Would you be praying not only uh, for God to reveal that person to you, but also for the courage to ask them to face down the fear and to put your trust in God to set apart Christ as Lord and to be prepared to face down those fears simply to bring glory to the God whom we worship. Let's pray. Father God, the author of good news, warm the hearts, we pray, of all who do the work of an evangelist. Open their mouths to proclaim the message of Christ and grant that all who hear may turn from the bondage of sin and seek the forgiveness of the Saviour. Grant to us, we pray, the courage to tell our story to share our testimony of your goodness and the transforming power of your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us the courage to invite others to join us in a journey of faith, which leads us to enthrone Jesus in our hearts. Give us, we pray, the words of life that we may share your redeeming grace to our neighbours and our friends. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.